we're the Burtons. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this Palm Sunday morning. Hey, we have a few announcements that we would like to share with you as we get started today. But before we do that, I just want to say we miss you guys. We miss our church family. And we are so grateful for the technology that allows us to connect during this time. So as we get started, uh, kids, why don't you just take a second and share what are some things that you have been doing and we have been doing to stay connected? Well, we acted out a couple of Bible scenes. We've been journaling a lot. We've been praying a lot together. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of togetherness. And you know, it's hard, it's also good. It's a great time for us to be together and grow. And we wanna be connected. We want you to be connected with us. Hopefully you've been seeing our posts, you've been seeing the videos and the devotionals we've been putting out. But you know what? We wanna see yours too. Go ahead and share. Always share your stuff with us so we can be connected to you as well. And you can go ahead and tag at FPC Edmund. And don't forget, during the services, the Facebook Live interaction is going on during worship. And we have pastors online during the services that are ready to pray with you. One of our core practices as a community is caring for each other. We've made it possible that you can fill out these yellow cards online. You get a yellow card, you get a yellow card, everybody gets yellow cards. All you have to do is follow the instructions on the screen. And this week is Holy Week. Uh, we won't have our services for Holy Week like we normally do, but we do have some opportunities to journey to the cross together. So be sure to watch for our Maundy Thursday posts, as well as a special time of live stream worship for a Good Friday service this Friday at seven o'clock. We would love for you all to tune in. Yes, Easter is coming up too, as you know. And you know that we've been doing the Plus One campaign where we've been encouraging you to bring your friends, invite a neighbor or someone you know that you wanna share Jesus with. You know, this COVID-19 situation does not keep us from sharing <clears throat> Jesus. And we have created a special Easter invite that you can share with your plus one or your plus 100. Go ahead, find that on Facebook or Instagram and share and invite and bring people to celebrate our risen savior with us. Again, thank you for being here. We love you. Hey kids and families, check this out. Good morning kids, church lady here. I am gonna wish you Happy Palm Sunday. <laughs> what is Palm Sunday? Oh, yes. Now I remember. It's when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And oh, wait, I, I, I don't want to tell you the story. We've got a special guest here this morning that's going to share the story. And it comes right from the Bible. John chapter 12, verse 12 through 13. Okay, I'm going to read it. The next day, the great crowd had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. <gasps> My gosh, can you imagine how everyone felt seeing Jesus ride in? Oh, I don't want to tell you the story. We've got a special guest here this morning. I'm so excited. Oh, I know you're going to be excited too. DJ Bible Man is here to tell us his story or his version of the story, which I think you're just going to love. So here he is. Hello there, church lady. Yes, it's me right here in the flesh. It's DJ Bible Man here. Yes, I'm just here today on Palm Sunday. And you know, I was thinking, this is my favorite Sunday. And the reason is because in the Bible it tells us that's when Jesus rode into town and everyone laid their coats on the ground and they waved their palm branches in the air and they shouted Hosanna. And it's just, it inspired me. And it got my creative juices flowing in my craft, just moving. And I wrote a brand new rap just for you. So you're going to hear it right now. So here's what I need some help with. Kids, you at home, I need your help. Give me a little clip clop sound, all right? Clip clop. That's exactly right. Clip clop. Clickety clack. Here comes a donkey with someone on his back. Riding on a donkey, looking mighty pretty. Here comes Jesus riding in our city. Put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Put the palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. 
What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And brother, can you tell me what the Hosanna's all about? And put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. I can't believe that I see Jesus fulfilling all the prophecy. He's riding in just like they said he'd always be. Put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Put those palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Church lady, you do it. Put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Kids, it's your turn now. Put your palms in the air. That's right. Wave them like you just don't care. Put those palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Happy, happy Palm Sunday, kids. And just remember, today, Jesus is in the house. But DJ Bibleman, well, I'm out. Isn't that wonderful? Put your palms in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Oh, that was so much fun. I'm so glad we were able to have him on today. And I have a challenge for you. Today, today, after church, I want you to go out on your porch and say, put your palms in the air. Happy Palm Sunday. Woo! And remember, our scripture was John chapter 12, verse 12 through 13. Go and read it with your mom and dad, and we'll see you next week. Hey, good morning, everybody. If you're right here tuning in right now, thank you so much. Wasn't that a ton of fun? I think uh, it's a great way to begin our worship together this morning to uh, just raise our hands in praise. It is Palm Sunday, as uh, they talked about, and we are here to praise his name. So right where you are, I want you to stand up. I want you to sing with us as we claim victory over the fear that is out in the world today. We are going to claim this victory and just give this to Jesus because he is worthy. He is above it all. And it is time to give him praise before the rocks cry out because blessed is his name. So let's sing together. falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph claim this truth my God will never fail oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know, I know how this story ends. Because I know how this story ends.
turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for real, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Claim this truth. Say it again. You take what the enemy meant for real, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. right where you are. I want to take the next few moments because we believe that his word is true and right now we are getting a lot of messages from all over the place. And his word gives us truth that we can stand on, that we can plant our feet upon that keep us from believing the fear that is around us. So I want you to read over these next few moments these truths that we find in his word about who he is and what he does. Claim these promises.
stop working. You never stop. He's always you never there. stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. into a time of prayer right now and we just want to invite you right where you are if you're there by yourself or if you're there with a couple of people um, I want to just give you some time right now to pray and to praise God on this Palm Sunday and as many times that we come through our sorrow that we just need to turn it to praise and cry out to God in praise and so I'm gonna ask you all this question what are the ways that you have seen God moving this week and also, what are the ways that you would be praying to see God move over this next week as we approach Easter? So I want to give you a couple of minutes to talk about that, to share that, uh, or write it down, just to claim it for praise and to give God all the glory for what he has done and what he is going to do. So just uh, take a couple minutes, and then we will pray together to close out our time of worship. so excited to be worshiping with you and I thank you for worshiping with us online through this live stream so that we can be together even when we're not able to give hugs and share fellowship in person. Thank you for being with us and please join me in praying 
And then um, at the end, I'm going to ask you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that you are the King, eternal, immortal, invisible. You reign on high and you are um, over all things. Nothing catches you by surprise. Nothing can overpower you or overcome you, God. Our, our eternity is secure because we are in you. And I thank you for the great knowledge and truth of your word. I thank you that Psalm 94 says, when our anxieties overwhelm us, your consolations are even greater. God, I thank you for that. I thank you that we can even lament to you. We can cry out to you. We can come to you with all of our tears and longings and losses, God, and you will meet those. And I pray that you would meet every need for every person that's with us, God, that you would um, abundantly fulfill your plan in our lives and you would cause us to see what you see, that we would long to be with you um, and on on purpose and on mission with you, God, doing what you are doing in the world. And I pray that you would use even the Corona pandemic, God, for your kingdom to come. And we want to pray today, God, like Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It's been so great to have you worshiping with us this morning. Um, we want to just continue to lean into God today as we prepare our hearts to hear the word. Let's do that now. morning. We want to continue the sermon series this morning looking at the last few hours of Jesus' life. And we've been going into extreme detail about how Jesus' last hours before he went to the cross proceeded. Today we want to talk about the cross in light of the coronavirus pandemic and the questions that it raises in our hearts and minds. And so we're going to lay aside some of the details we've been going into and talk about Jesus as king, talk about how Jesus saves us, and talking about all the ways that he is at work in our world even through this. Listen to the word of God, Mark chapter 15, verses 25 through 32. It says, it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you know what is on our hearts this morning as we hear your word. And God, we know that your word meets us where we are. You know that your word speaks to us, even though it was written long ago, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to us now through it. And we pray this morning, God, that he would speak because there are so many of us who are in deep need this morning, who are wondering what you are doing 
who are wondering where you are at work, who are wondering what is next for me and my family and my life. Lord Jesus, we know that you love us so very much and the cross demonstrates that. We know there is no length you will not go to save us. We know that you are king. We know that all attempts to work our way to you are simply futile because you have come to us. And so this morning, meet us where we are, that we may hear your word and be transformed. All this we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. This week I picked up lunch from a restaurant in town, which I'm getting used to driving up to the curbside, and they bring it out to you. And the woman who brought my meal out was clearly at a low point. She was overwhelmed. She was, she was struggling. And as she handed me the bag, I felt compelled to ask, is everything okay? And she said, well, I'll be okay. And I pressed a little more because I could see she was having a really hard time. And we spoke for a bit. And she finally said at the end, somewhat half-jokingly, I just don't know why God would allow this to happen. The coronavirus is just making us ask, where is God? What is he doing? And we're asking that across all sectors of our society. Last week, the British theologian N.T. Wright, who's one of the best-known Christian teachers in the world, wrote an article for Time magazine where he claimed that Christianity has no answer for the coronavirus. Another article I read quoted Christians from all over the theological spectrum sharing their opinion about what God is doing through the virus. Everything from preparing us for the second coming of Jesus to changing the way we live to holding America accountable for multiplicity of idols. One pastor called it a divine reset. There's another article I read about some Catholic priests who said that the virus has unleashed intense demonic activity meaning that God has given evil a free hand. The woman at her low point who brought me my lunch simply said, I think God wants our attention. You know, it's okay to ask God hard questions from a point of faith. A loving God is not above our questions. He hears even our allegations. He hears our heartaches. He hears our doubts. He hears our anger. The most mature Christians I know have big questions for God. Amazingly enough, when Jesus was amidst his greatest trial, when he was amidst his greatest heartache, his greatest persecution, his, his, his greatest pain and betrayal, we learn more about who God is and what he is doing today than at any other point in Scripture. You see, that day that Jesus was crucified, he wasn't questioned by the faithful. He wasn't questioned by hopeful skeptics. Instead, his enemies mocked him. The religious leaders who made sure that he was crucified mocked him. Passers-by jeered the guilty crucified alongside him, hurled insults. You see, they misunderstood who Jesus is, and they misunderstood him in some basic ways. And the cross reveals to us some very basic truths about who Jesus is, and these truths inform our, our understanding. And they illuminate our questions, and they give us hope about what Jesus is doing amidst the coronavirus or even any other difficult time we may be facing. We see a few things in the story this morning. We see these allegations. First, Jesus is king. Second, Jesus destroys religion. And third, Jesus can save you. What does it mean to say that Jesus is king? Mark 15, 25 through 26 says, it was about the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. Roman law ensured that the condemned had their charges displayed, usually, usually carried around their neck on some sort of board so that the world could see their crime. In Jesus' case, it was written on a board in three languages. And it was apparently nailed to the top of the cross. And this was known as a, a titulus. Which, means, uh, which, in, which in Latin means bill or placard. And Jesus was not only surrounded by people who, who mocked his supposed kingmanship while he was on the cross, but in the headquarters of Pontius Pilate. 
There was a legion of soldiers, 600 Roman soldiers. They were called together to watch him, which meant that Jesus was now being treated like an enemy of the state. He was being treated like he was a threat to Rome. And after they beat him until he was nearly dread, they dressed him in the costume of a king. Mark 15, 17 through 20 says, They clothed him in a purple coat and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him. And they began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with the reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him out of the purple cloak and put his clothes on him. Now the idea of this seemingly insignificant man from Galilee being a king, it would have seemed outrageous to those soldiers. That's why they put the purple robe on his back, lashed to ribbons with a whip. That's why they mashed a crown of thorns with six-inch long thorns onto his head. That's why they mockingly kneeled down so they could show their incredulity that this humble servant of a man could be any kind of king. They didn't know how wrong they truly were. They couldn't have been more wrong. Because against all appearances, Jesus, this unassuming, unpedigreed man from the backwaters of Galilee, was a king, is a king. And not just king of the Jews. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. In fact, he knit together in their mother's womb every single one of those 600 soldiers. And every one of those soldiers who bow down and mock homage to Jesus will once again bend their knee someday along with the whole of creation and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because this man who stood at great pains, battling to remain conscious, bleeding profusely under his crown and under his robe, as the robe stuck to the deep gashes in his body, is a greater king than they could ever imagine. Years later, there was a resident of Jerusalem who, when Jesus was crucified, was surely aware of his trial and wholeheartedly approved of everything. A man later named Paul, he would say that Jesus' kingship literally holds the cosmos in place. Colossians 1, 15 through 18 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. You know, God's power, his sovereignty, his lordship over all creation appears at times and in places and in manners that we do not often suspect we may even find hard to believe. We might even be offended by it. Jesus displays his unquestioned lordship by making himself a servant, by making himself a slave. You see, Jesus' kingdom does not need proving. Jesus' lordship does not need to be demonstrated. So Jesus the king enters into desperate situations, hopeless circumstances, for you and me. One of my favorite paintings is a famous work called the Eisenheim Altarpiece. It is a starkly realistic, even, even, even unsettling picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. And in the altarpiece, his hands are twisted in this very unnatural position, and he is nearly unconscious. And you can, you can count the ribs on his gaunt figure. But what disturbs most people are the sores that cover Jesus' skin. He doesn't look like he's been injured from his beatings as much as he is deathly ill from sickness. And that was intentional on the part of the artist. 
You see, the altarpiece was commissioned for a, a German monastery, the Brothers of St. Anthony, and they ran a hospital for treatment of diseases. And St. Anthony is the Roman Catholic patron saint of skin diseases. And the brothers treated what was known as St. Anthony's fire. And St. Anthony's fire caused painful lesions over the, over the whole of the body and even attacked the central nervous system, causing the patient to uh, hallucinate. The artist who painted Jesus on the cross intentionally painted him as suffering from St. Anthony's fire. And as the women and the men in the hospital run by the monks stared at this painting, there is the unmistakable message, God is with me. They might have even thought of Isaiah 53, 4. And Matthew 8, 17, which quote the promise, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. You see, Jesus displays his lordship, his absolute reign over the world, not from reigning on high, not waving a scepter and adjusting his crown or throwing lightning bolts down at a disobedient world. Instead, he displays his lordship by taking on our illnesses, by bearing our diseases, not separating himself from our imperfections, our infirmities and our sin, but by making them his own. If we suffer... The reality of the cross, the promise of the cross, is that Jesus suffers with us, that we do not suffer alone. And we know that all suffering with Jesus ends eventually in triumph because he's king. He is king. Second thing we notice in this passage is that Jesus destroys religion. He destroys religion. Mark 15 again tells us, they crucified him with two robbers, one on his right hand and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. On a blood-soaked stone hill, Jesus made religion irrelevant. Now you may say, what is religion? Isn't what you're doing here today religion? What we're doing here today is different. You see, religion is humanity's quest to meet God and to achieve something eternal. We all have our religion. We all have that thing that we think gives our life meaning if we do it well enough. Whether it is work or it is success, or it is family, or it is sports, or it is self-righteousness, or it is relationships. You see, following Jesus is not a religion. Following Jesus is a faith. Faith is the assurance that on that blood-soaked hill, God met us, and he lays eternity right in our lap. You see, religion will not satisfy us like God will. If religion is what we're after, we'll abandon it as soon as something else comes along that makes us feel better. The French writer, Albert Camus, he wasn't a Christian, but he was a brilliant observer of, of human nature, and he wrote a novel called The Plague. And The Plague is about a town which was infected with the plague, and it was placed un, under quarantine, and all the gates were locked, and no one could go in the town, and no one could come out of the town. At first, Camus said people turned to religion until they realized religion could not help them, until they realized something easier and better. He wrote, in the early days, when they thought this epidemic was much like other epidemics, religion held its ground. But once these people realized their immediate peril, they gave their thoughts to pleasure. You see, religion cannot satisfy our spiritual hunger because it all boils down to the same question. What makes me feel good? If feeling good is what we're after, there's a lot of ways to be satisfied. The British apologist C.S. Lewis famously said, I didn't go to religion to be happy. I always knew a bottle of port could do that. You see, Jesus doesn't give us good feelings. 
Jesus gives us God. It was a very short walk from the praetorium where Jesus was sentenced and beaten to Golgotha. An average person can walk it in about four minutes. Golgotha was just outside the garden gate of the city of Jerusalem. It was just a few hundred yards away. It sat right outside the city walls and alongside the main road that ran from Jerusalem to Jaffa, which is the main port city of Israel along the Mediterranean Sea. Golgotha was in an old stone quarry. It had been dug out in the 6th century, leaving a little hill about 25 feet high or so. And the stone of that hill resembled a, a human skull. And it was not suitable for building because it was too soft. That hill of stone had in it, and still has in it to this day, a giant crack right in the middle, making it unusable for building. Jesus was crucified atop that hill of rejected stone. And the stone taken from the quarry that surrounded it was not to build just any old structure, was not to build any, anyone's home in Jerusalem, but that stone that was rejected was to be used for the building of the Jerusalem temple, the center of religion for the Jewish people, the very place where they sacrificed and sanctified themselves in order to please God. And as Jesus hung on the cross, he would only have had to turn his head slightly to see the temple just a few hundred yards away. None of this surprised Jesus because he predicted that his people, the Jewish people, would reject him and they would choose religion instead. Matthew 21, 42 says, Jesus said, Have you ever or have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You see, Jesus described himself in terms that a stonemason would use. And when he died on the cross, it was on a hill of rejected stone. The cross on which the sins of humanity were given was planted into the heart of a stone. A hill that was found unusable, rejected to build a religious shrine. You see, Jesus is the very cornerstone of our faith, rejected by very devout, very, very pious people who chose instead religion, who chose instead rather than receiving the grace of God to work their way toward God. And Jesus promised, he promised as his disciples at that, that week as they walked through Jerusalem and they gawked at the majesty of the, of the temple, Jesus promised that he would tear that temple down that he'd build another temple. He promised that not one of those massive stones would remain stacked upon another. Well, what was the temple? And what was its purpose? You see, the Jerusalem temple was a place of sacrifice. It was where the priests sacrificed sheep and they sacrificed doves and, and cattle that people needed to atone for their sin. But it was also the place where the Jews believed the presence of God dwelt, the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus promised a new temple. He promised a new place for the Holy Spirit of God to dwell. Where is that new temple? The new temple is you. The new temple is me. It is in every believer in Jesus Christ, every disciple, we are the new dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. As soon as Jesus died, when he cried out and he gave up his last breath, we were told that the Holy Spirit was loose from the temple, that he was poured out upon the world. You see, in the very back of the, the Jerusalem temple, there is a room known as the Holy of Holies, and it was built over the very top of the mountain, of, over a large piece of exposed stone, and it was there that the Jews believed the Holy Spirit made his dwelling place. See, between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple, there was a massive curtain separating the dwelling place of God from the rest of the temple and from the whole of the earth. And according to one ancient source, it was 60 feet high, and it was 30 feet wide, and it was about the thickness of the palm of your hand, and it was so heavy, it took 300 priests to carry it. And that curtain 
that massive curtain, when Jesus died, was ripped in two from the very top to its very bottom, demonstrating that Jesus' death had let loose the Holy Spirit into the world. Matthew 27, 51 through 53, it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and were coming out of the tombs after his resurrection. They went into the holy city, and they appeared to many. And you may wonder, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, why were the tombs open? And why were the dead raised and restored to life and, and walking around Jerusalem? Because the Holy Spirit raised them to life. The Holy Spirit animated their bodies in the same way that the Holy Spirit would raise Jesus from the dead three days later before dawn that coming Sunday morning. And Jesus himself spoke about this event to the 12 disciples on the very day before he was crucified. John 14, it says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of, of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If our religion is our attempt to get to God, Jesus has destroyed religion because he has ensured that God is already with us, that God dwells with us, that God is in us. We cannot work our way to God because he is already here. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, he is in you and me. And by ejecting on that hill of rejected stone, Jesus destroyed even the most well-intentioned, earnest attempts to get to God. And when he preached, the kingdom of God has come near, this is what he meant. That God himself has been poured into our very lives. See, the cross promises this. God is has come to us. God meets us where we are. And religion is unnecessary and redundant and futile. The last thing we want to talk about this morning is the simple truth that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Mark 15, 31 through 32, it says, So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from that cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And so the masses, they mocked Jesus for not saving himself miraculously by coming down from the cross. They wanted to see him do something spectacular. They wanted to see him do something that would make their spirits tingle. But in the end, what Jesus did was he was obedient to the Father on the cross that day, and he paid for every sin of humanity. And as he took his last breath, the Roman soldier in charge of his crucifixion called out, Truly, this man was the Son of God. You see, in the end, as we stare at the cross, there are only two responses to Jesus. Either we receive him or we reject him. Either we receive his salvation or we reject it. Either we cry out, Jesus, save us, or we whisper, Jesus, Believe us. When we all look back, and someday we will, on the battle against the coronavirus, we're going to be able to name a low point, a place where we felt very little hope, where we reached our limit, where we simply wanted someone to do 
something. There are parents who are, who are going to be pushed to the edge with being cooped up in their house all day long with their kids. Others are going to struggle not seeing their aging parents who are quarantined. Kids will miss school. They might even uh, miss the last few weeks of their senior year. Others are losing a precious season of baseball or softball or track. Some will have a low point of losing a job. Others are getting sick. And some may even experience worse than illness as the deaths continue to rise. But there will be a point where we cry out, Jesus, save us. I hope we don't cry out to mind-numbing escapes to save us or work to save us or busyness to save us or the government to save us. I hope we cry out to Jesus because Jesus saves. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's not just a sign people hold up at football games or, 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 or a slogan or a mantra. It is a life-saving truth. It is the one unassailable answer to the problem that something is not right with this world and something is not right with me. You see, behind every despondent server bringing somebody lunch is a question. What is God doing? Beyond every article, seeking divine intent, there is a desperate cry, Jesus, save us. Have you cried that prayer during the last few weeks? How can we know he will? How can we know he will? You see, if Jesus didn't crawl down from the cross, if he didn't call on a, a, a legion of his angel army to destroy every Roman soldier and religious leader and every slack-jawed gawker walking past Golgotha along the road from Jerusalem to Jaffa, then how can we know he can save us from our sin? How can we know that he will save us now? We know because we are here today. You see, the Romans crucified hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions it was their way to exert their authority to say that the power of Rome was unmatched and unassailable and to intimidate anyone who dared to claim otherwise. And yet, here we are today, worshiping one of those men as God. Why? Because his tomb was empty, as we'll celebrate next week? Yes. But also... Because Jesus has ensured we are still here. He has preserved his church. He has protected and prospered his church in every age, every place, everywhere. He's preserved his church through war and through famine and through persecution and through genocide and pestilence and, yes, even disease. Jesus saves. From the very first days of the church, the world has tried to stomp out and remove by any means necessary Jesus' followers from the world, and we are still here. Ideas come and go. Living languages become dead tongues. Institutions succeed and disappear. Cities, cities thrive and fade. Civilizations flourish and collapse. Nations rise and fall. Economic structures blossom and wither. But we are still here. The church is still here. Why? Because we're so good? Because we're experts at what we do? No. No. It's because Jesus has chosen to save us. What is Jesus doing? In the middle of this battle against the coronavirus, that for our culture, for our time, for our age, feels a little like a crucifixion. <laughs> what does Jesus' battle on the cross show us? 
It shows us he is king. It shows us that God is with us. It shows us that he will save us. Come, Lord Jesus, save us. Amen. If you regularly attend First Presbyterian Church of Edmond, you know that the first Sunday of the month is when we normally gather together around the table and we receive communion. We've made the decision to wait until we gather together once again as a family in our sanctuary together to take communion as one body. Jesus himself said, I will not taste again of the fruit of the vine until I taste it again in my kingdom with all of you. It is important for us to gather as one family. It is important for us to be, be one body together in physical proximity as a family. And so we are planning, and we don't know when that day will be, we are planning that when we once again gather together in this sanctuary, that we will do it in celebration, and we will do it in great joy, and we will have an amazing feast that day as we gather around the table of our risen Lord. We look forward to that day so very much. We miss you terribly. We miss seeing your faces. We miss being in, in touch with you in person. We have a wonderful church, a wonderful church family. And we are so excited to gather again together as the body of Christ. We'll see you soon. Amen. but just as Pastor Eric was bringing the word today, I feel like we just need to take a moment before we close out and just cry to Jesus. It's a simple song. Just sing this together. It goes like this. We cry out to you. Cry out to you, oh God. We cry out to tell the world of what you've done. Again. We cry out to you, cry out to you, oh God. Whatever it is you want to lay before him. We cry out. of it.
when death was arrested and my life began Just stand and sing it Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains when we cry to Him, my orphan heart is given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, in my life began. It's grace for oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me. knowing that Jesus is king and that God is with us. We don't need to work our way to him and that Jesus will save you wherever you are. And all God's people said, hallelujah, amen.